Welcome everybody um, to the SIOM Central Southern Branch uh, Annual Seminar on Property Flood Resilience. Uh, so my name is Annie Fisher and I'm the current chair of the branch um, and I've organised this uh, seminar alongside uh, Alex and Jed, my, my vice chairs. Um, so we welcome you today. Um, I'm sure you know because you've already signed up, but this is a three part series. So today is part one, uh, focusing on from PFR strategy to delivery. Uh, we've got another two sessions tomorrow and Thursday from 12 till 1 p.m. Um, and your registration en enables you entry to all, all three of those. Um, the, the format of the session, uh, we've been hear hearing from various speakers across the three days. Um, uh, they're going to talk for a short time. And then at the end, we're, we're trying to promote discussion, sort of panel, panel discussion. Um, so just, just while you're watching, if you have questions and things, sort of, that's, that's the aim we're going for, to promote some healthy discussion at the end there. Um, just before we start, I'm going to do some housekeeping. Um, so as with all our other events, this uh, webinar will be recorded. Um, everyone entering now is entering as attendee. So you are able to um, put questions in the Q&A box uh, and any technical issues into the chat box, uh, but you will be muted uh, and off camera. Um, the three sessions will count for three hours of, of CPD, uh, but we don't issue certificates for those. Um, and hopefully within the next week or so, these sessions will also be available on YouTube um, if you'd like to, uh, to listen back. Um, just some general points about SIOM for anybody that's new to SIOM uh, or wants to know about upcoming events at the moment. Um, so SIOM itself uh, is a, a Royal uh, Chartered Professional Body and Independent Charity. Uh, whose aim is to work towards a safer, more sustainable world, building a, a global community of water and environmental professionals um, dedicated to working for the public benefit. Um, and SIOM have now switched to the virtual world, reaching out to a global audience, uh, providing relevant and accessible events for the community. Um, and we hope we help to connect local to national to international through the digital series. Um, so I'm hoping today that we get a, a far reaching network of people joining um, as, it's, as it's a virtual event. Um, SIWEM in 2019 uh, made a climate and ecological uh, declaration um, and so many of the events, the events that SIWEM are hosting and, and topics are all linked into those. Um, SIWEM are supporting the uh, Climate Emergency COP26 um, seminar coming up in, in Glasgow. I'm sure you all have heard about that. Uh, that's taking part uh, place yeah, this, this November. Um, and also there's currently one uh, of a bio, COP15, which about focusing on biodiversity and e ecological emergency, um, which is taking place in this virtual at the moment. And there's a new date next year um, that's taking place in, in, in China. So SIOM are supporting those. Um, so do keep an eye out for events uh, and news, news bites and things related to those. Um, all links for these kind of events uh, and anything relevant throughout the topic, uh, the, the webinar, sorry, uh, Barbara will be posting in the chat box. Um, and if you do have any further questions of, of uh, links and things, we will um, get those in, in, in the chat box today. Um, I'm going to just do a little introduction now to the speakers for today. Um, so these include um, Ian Gibbs, um, who is the te National Technical Manager in Sedgwick and Vice Chair of the DEFRA Flood Resilience Roundtable, um, who's been part of the team designing the SIOM Property Flood Resilience Training. Um, he also delivers flood resilience surveys and has a practical understanding of the issues of property flood resilience and the particular challenges surrounding the delivery of PFR during flood claims. We're hearing from uh, Alistair Mosley, who's an Honorary Vice Chair of SIOM uh, and Director of his own consultancy practice, H2O WEM Limited. He has over 30 years experience in water and environmental management, including flood risk and mitigation, and was one of the first investigators of the Code of Practice in conjunction with Alistair Chisholm, who is uh, our um, chair today, uh, Alan Cripps and David Balforth. Uh, we'll also be hearing from Catherine Grieg, who is head of transition at Flood Re. Um, she is scoring project lead for Flood Re, linking scoring with flood performance certificates. Uh, and alongside Dr. Bev, Ev, uh, Bev Adams, sorry, Head of Climate and Catastrophe Resilience. She is a PFR Roundtable Business Adoption Pathway Lead and Project Director. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the, the panel discussion will be chaired by Alistair Chisholm, who is Director of Policy uh, at SIWEM and will be facilitating the discussion later, uh, later today. Okay, so before we make a start on the actual presentations, I'm going to uh, hand over now to 
Ian Gibbs to give a bit of an overview of the, the aim of today's sessions. Um, and then we'll start hearing from our, our speakers. So, so over to you, Ian. Thanks, Anya. Um, and welcome everybody from myself and the team talking to you today. It's a great pleasure to be with you to talk about property flood resilience. Um, I'm being joined, as you've heard, by a great team of speakers who are really knowledgeable in flood resilience. And they're going to give you their thoughts on their sort of area of expertise. Now, in my view, flood resilience has made really big strides in the last two to three years. With government announcements and government policy change, the Environment Agency action, what we've been doing, I like to think, on the Death for Flood Resilience Roundtable, um, there's flood groups and other um, charities um, that are heavily involved in, in supporting people in times of flood. Um, the recent government announcement, I'm talking the last few months, talking about uh, spending on flood defences, was also talking about flood resilience in a big way for the first time. So there's a real twin track approach and strategy by government, which isn't just we're going to build defences, it's we're going to look at the sustainability of our environment and realise that people and communities have to take action, as, as well as the Environment Agency um, building defences, which is an important part of what we do as well. Um, so we hope to provide you really with the latest developments and thinking on flood resilience, as well as an introduction to the subject if you don't know anything about it. So you'll start to hopefully feel at the end of this that you know this, what this flood resilience is all about in, in the concept um, and sort of the areas that are really being worked on at the moment to make it a more um, uh, you know, successful, I suppose, area of, area of work. Um, we've all worked together, the presenters today, uh, for a number of years, um, working on flood resilience and share a passion for the subject and really want to make a difference um, and help um, really allow communities, businesses and individuals to be able to access flood resilience, to have confidence and rely on the fact that it works. Um, and as um, Bev and um, Catherine will talk about later, you know, be recognised by the key people that, that are stakeholders in this whole process. So how we're going to do this is firstly, Alice is going to talk to you about the code of practice. Um, from the very start, uh, Alice is involved and a huge amount of time has been put in to build this code, which is I like to think of as the how to guide for flood resilience. There's um, factual information about the code, but also, as we'll explain later, there's a really good document which explains um, how you would go about it in more detail. So the practical implementation of, of flood resilience. Um, so that will give you that start of a 10 about what flood resilience is all about. Um, then Catherine and Bev are going to talk to you about the work they've been doing as part of a project on, from the Death for Flood Resilience Roundtable um, about scoring. So what's really important we've learned is, is how people can value and assess whether the flood resilience has been done and has been successful and what value it brings to the various stakeholders. Um, which links in seamlessly, as you'd expect, with flood performance certificates. So, you know, you have certificates for um, energy efficiency. So what about the concept of a flood performance certificate? Um, and they'll sort of bring how this fits in with a, with a whole concept of, you know, the uptake of, of PFR. Finally, you hear from me talking about um, the skills gap, as I would call it, which is where we have these ambitions to make flood resilience more a widespread activity, but we need the people involved in the whole process to have the skills, knowledge and experience and be those um, professionals doing surveys, be they contractors, be they insurance companies to really understand uh, what it's all about. So enough from me, hopefully you'll enjoy the session um, and Anna, I think you're passing over to Alistair first. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you, Ian. I'll just pass on. So yeah, I'll just hand over to, to Alistair uh, and stay in the background while you uh, take it away. <laughs> thanks very much, Anya. Uh, and th thanks Ian for that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, you're going to get an awful lot out of these uh, three sessions over the next three days, I can assure you. Um, so the, the Code of Practice and the Guidance for Property Flood Resilience, I'm going to tell you about that, um, some of its origins and what it aims to cover. Um, the most important thing to notice though is the Syria document, Syria C790, uh, which you can access freely on the internet. And I'll come back to that a little bit later on. So next slide, please. So first of all, what is, what is property flood resilience? Is it, is it a first line of defense uh, or is it the measure of last resort? Well, what it is, it's a whole property concept 
And it actually does both of those things. It can either be that first line of protection or it can be the thing when, when everything else has failed. Uh, next slide. So why do we need um, this, this, this form of protection? Well, over two and a half, half million properties in the UK are at risk of flooding. These statistics are, they vary slightly, but they're broadly, broadly correct. Um, another 2.8 million UK properties at risk of, of surface water flooding, 1.6 UK properties located in areas where there's significant risk of flooding. Um, and it goes on, you can see from there. The one the interesting one, as many as 40% of businesses uh, fail to reopen after a flood. So flooding has a, a terrible impact on businesses and it has a terrible impact on, on people. Uh, can lead to all terrible mental health conditions. Um, as we all know, if you, are, if you are evicted from your home because of the house is flooded and you can't get back into it for maybe a year, um, that must be psychologically very, very damaging. Next slide, please. So a couple of slides here just to show um, how awful it is when the sewage gets into, uh, when the it can be sewage, but when the, when the water gets into your home, um, everything is ruined, soft furnishings ruined, floorings, walls, coverings. Um, and that's all part of, of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the resilience, if you like, of the property, because what you want to be able to do is to get the property back into action as quickly as you can uh, after a flood. And of course, these things, if they've soaked up all the water, they're, they're noxious, horrible, um, terrible devastation for people. Next slide, please. And here's some pictures of um, why you might want it as a, as a last resort. Um, the picture on the right is actually of a flood defence being breached. Um, so those properties who were behind that to defence that were thought they were protected may well then flood and, um, and property flood resilience could actually help overcome that if it was in place. Next slide, please. So um, before we had the code of practice, um, property flood resilience was already being practised by, by people. Um, there were some great products out there, or well, there still are, but there was even, even four or five years ago, some great products. Uh, we had the, um, the beginnings of a good British standard for property flood resilience, which is past 1188. And, and that has uh, now turned into a full blown uh, British standard. And but the problem was, uh, there was no real formal guidance as to how to do property flood resilience. And there were all sorts of people out there that were doing their very best. They were you know, well-meaning amateurs, if you like, but they actually weren't providing the protection that, was, was, that could really be provided if it was done properly. Um, equally, there were some companies doing it well. And the reason we, had the idea of coming up with the code of practice is the companies that were doing it well were complaining that they were being undercut by people who weren't doing it very well and and consequently people being left at risk of flooding so here you've got some pictures on the left hand side showing some property flood resilience that hasn't been done very well clearly the water can can find its way around that and breach it and on the right hand side that picture there is a picture of a, a demonstration uh, flood resilient home which is at bre's establishment in the uh, in uh, Watford and definitely worth a visit uh, for those of you that have not seen it uh, and it incorporates all of the sort of resilience features that I'll mention a little bit later on. Next slide please. So about 2015-2016 um, DEFRA um, instigated a, um, an initiative to look at property flood resilience and at the same time SIWEM, um, of, of which I'm a, a vice president, I was president many years ago, um, we were, we'd been approached by a number of companies that were saying, is there anything we can do to try and introduce a standard? And so we had our own little round table, SIWEM, which involved a lot of people. And we, we discovered that, that DEFRA were doing the same and we had an overlap and we joined forces. And uh, we now we put our weight behind the, the section of the Property Flood Resilience Action Plan that had been led by Peter Bonfield up until then, <clears throat> which focused on standards. And, uh, and we convened a small working group and uh, we came up with the concept of a code of practice. And we then went through a process of getting that, that written. And it's taken about five years, as you know, for those of you that have been following this to get there. Um, another person that should have been mentioned here is Graham Brogdon, by the way. Graham Brogdon took over from Peter Bonfield as chair of the uh, Property Flood Resilience um, Round Table, as, it, as it's called. Uh, and overseeing the um, delivery of the standards uh, as part of the action plan. So Graham, uh, if you're watching, I'm just putting a shout in for you there. Uh, next slide, please. So what does property flood resilience mean? Well, it isn't just about putting um, gates across doors to stop water getting in, <clears throat> because water can find its way in through the walls, through the fabric of the walls, it can find its way up through the floors. Um, it can come in through drainage out openings and sewage outlets. That's one of the reasons I mentioned sewage earlier on, because you can often get sewage in, in floodwaters. 
And this little diagram here just shows the, the areas where flood resilience measures can be deployed and all of those feature in the, uh, in the code of practice. Next slide, please. So what are the benefits of a code of practice? Well, we wanted to create a single source information point that sets the benchmark for PFR, and it certainly does that. So the guidance document in particular is, a, is definitely a how-to guide as to do things well, and also how to do how not to do things badly. It's very important. It's, it takes a structured approach and it incorporates layers of information for varying knowledge, uh, the varying knowledge base of users. We're targeting it at everybody, the professional community, and to also uh, domestic people and, and, uh, and lay people, property owners. And above all, it, it strives to be clear, consistent, <clears throat> and give confidence. And that's that's been the underpinning um, philosophy, if you like, of the whole document as we've developed it. It isn't a standard in itself. It supports the standards that are out there. So the British standards that are applying, uh, it's an umbrella document that embraces those, but it sets the standards that should be followed in order to make a property, property from resilience. Next slide, please. So the code of practice uh, that we have now that was uh, launched in two stages, 2020, the standards were launched and this year, 2021, the guidance was launched along with some supporting documents. Um, it provides clear information. Um, we've condensed the, um, the delivery of property flood resilience into six clear standards, um, which are delivered through six clear stages and supporting information on, on materials and products and where you, where you can go for help and the professionals that you might need to engage with. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so at the moment, if you go onto the Syria website and you, uh, you, you've searched for a code of practice for property flood resilience, you'll find there are four documents on there. Uh, on the left-hand side, we've got the main standard itself, um, which uh, incorporates the six standards and describes what they are. It's a fairly short document, about 20 pages. Um, and then we have the, um, the Code of Practice Guidance for Flood Resilience, uh, which is a, a very big document, nearly 200 pages, and that goes into a lot of detail on how to deliver um, the, 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 uh, the, the standards, if you like. And then we have two guidance documents that are also variable, uh, available at the moment. On the right-hand side there, you'll see the guidance for planners. And the one that I'm really, really caught my eye, which I've not really seen it until early this week, is the one in the, uh, the, the blue-covered one, which um, is, a, is a really simple how-to guide. It's, it's, a, it's a, a bit of a, a light touch one, if you like, to before you go and delve into the detail of the code of practice itself. Next slide, please. So um, the documents embrace four key parts. The first one is about property flood resilience. So it's telling you what it is, uh, how it's applied, when you should use it. Um, then we have part B, which is the, the code of practice itself, which is the six standards that I referred to. And then you have the guidance, which takes us through the, the, uh, the, the uh, six stages of delivery. Um, so starting with hazard, uh, what are the hazard assessments? What, what, why is the property at risk of flooding? And then a property survey, how to do that. Options for, um, uh, for development, in other words, the, stat, the, the, the methods you're gonna use. Then guidance for the constructors, the people who are gonna install it. Very important, commissioning and handover. There's no point putting these things in unless the, uh, the, the, the homeowner is able to actually physically use it and be confident in it. And then very important, operation and maintenance. How do you maintain and keep your flood resilience uh, in good condition? And then part D is supporting information. Now, all of these documents are online and they are intended to be essentially live. They will be updated, revised as, uh, in time. Um, but you will ultimately be able to get hard copies of these documents. I'm not actually sure where we are in terms of hard copies, but the most important thing is uh, you can get online now and you can see these documents and use them um, and be confident that they are going to be updated um, to make sure that they're embracing any latest developments in materials and standards. Next slide, please. So there's the, uh, the website you need to go to, uh, www.syria.org. Uh, the documents are all free to download. And, uh, and I would urge anybody that's involved in property flood resilience to, 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 to look at these and, uh, and use them with confidence because uh, they are an essential cornerstone in, uh, in property flood resilience and, uh, and flood, flood mitigation in this country. Thanks, Anya. Great. Thank you very much, Alistair. Um, I will keep the momentum going given, given time, but thank you very much. So now I'll be passing over to uh, Catherine and, and Bev. Thanks, Anya. Can you hear me? Yep, can hear. Yep, can see. Excellent. So 
Thank you to Ian and to Alistair for um, setting the stage. Uh, you can progress right along. I'm going to speak about the scoring project as um, was mentioned particularly by Ian, and this is really, as he said, how people will evaluate specific PFR strategies. We're really looking at this, if you go to the next slide, as a journey of discovery um, with a PFR roundtable um, sponsored project. Flood Re, as the industry's reinsurance, um, that's the insurance for insurers, if you will, is sponsoring the initial phase of the project where we're really looking at who the key stakeholders are and what the elements need to be to make a benchmark um, standard that can be incorporated either for banks or for insurance companies as they evaluate a specific structure and the PFR that has been added to that. So we anticipate that phase zero will go through early next year and we plan to offer to launch a tender process uh, beginning in January um, when we would then look to run the full project um, to through um, design, implementation and testing and a pilot with a controlled launch. Uh, it is worth noting that we are looking for strategies that cover both domestic properties and commercial properties, even though Flood Reed does not underwrite commercial properties. And the reason for that is a couple of things. First, we are very interested from Flood Reed's point of view to bolster the resilience of UK PLC writ large. And we recognize that communities are only as um, sustainable and resilient as the small and medium-sized businesses that surround homes, as well as the infrastructure, as well as the sheer economies of scale of doing the project simultaneously. So um, we're very excited to be um, commencing a look at both of those. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, there's lots of key stakeholders and we are reaching both across government, um, across the developed nations, across various departments, including um, Treasury and Bayes isn't on here, but we would like to see them involved as well as the Bank of England. And then uh, a, a whole host of insurers and banks um, to both ensure that what is produced is something that they can utilize. So in the same way, when I'm evaluated as a potential driver, when I buy car insurance, they'll ask me, you know, what kind of car, how long have I been driving, um, and so on. Um, this is a look at a home to say, uh, where is it located and what sort of strategies have been put in place. And ideally, then um, when flood re exits the market, uh, the insurers will have a mechanism by which to evaluate a flood insurance premium that conceivably could be lower if the strategies were scored in a way that really showed the benefit of the risk mitigation. Next slide, please. So this is just more detail on the outreach that we plan to do. Um, banks and building societies, of course, are looking at the 30-year time horizon of a mortgage and therefore need to think about what can make that asset sustainable in the face of climate change and increasing risk. And surely um, PFR strategies are one tool in the toolbox to do that. Uh, I've already talked through the insurer example. Homeowners, we know, you know, I have a hard time when my dishwasher is broken, let alone my kitchen completely out of um, capacity or any space at all. And we know that the mental health impacts of any sort of flood are um, extremely uh, difficult and to keep people to enable people to get back into their homes as soon as possible and to take control of a risk um, really is a best case in, in best case scenario. Um, businesses, of course, want to be able to uh, stay online and um, we want this process to support 
the full industry of PFR. Um, so everything from the out best in case or best practice outreach to what solutions should be in place and um, giving homeowners the confidence that what they're installing um, has the benefits that we're trying to translate to banks and insurers. Next slide, please. Um, so all of the success of a scoring system means we have to bring all of those um, parties along, including um, the various initiatives that are happening in England and Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, and we really want um, to make sure that the implementation reflects both, both the practice and the theory. Next slide, please. So this, as um, Ian uh, alluded to, project exists around and um, in support of the flood performance certificates. Um, it is sponsored by the PFR roundtable at the bottom. Um, it's leveraging the code of practice, which you've just heard about, um, and is really meant to create an ecosystem where there is a known translation of what strategy goes into your home to a financial benefit um, in the best instance and a, in some sense, mental health benefit for a homeowner to recognize that if and when they are subject to a flood, they have prepared themselves as best as they could. Um, and they're, they're presumably most important asset to withstand that flooding. Next slide, please. And from there, I will pass it on to Beth. Brilliant. Uh, thanks so much, Catherine. I think one of the things that is really important to realize is that the scoring initiative that we're now driving is born out of need. And so when we helped develop practice, that was a necessary foundation for you all to have some governance and structure around how we approach flood resilience for it. And if you could just back up a couple of slides, I want to go back to the point on the right, which was some language that we have been using in our role, one more up, thank you, um, which talks around design resilient, build resilient, invest resilient, maintain resilient and recover resilient. So in my role as head of climate and catastrophe resilience at Marsh, I'm working with thousands upon thousands of businesses every day. And many of them are having problems with their insurance renewals. Many of them are having problems obtaining credit. Many of them are having problems obtaining mortgages. Many of them have been flooded and haven't recovered resiliently in the past. And so this is where it's actually a really important and timely piece of work because if we don't do it, we're still stuck with just having the risk maps and there's no reason and no ability to then reflect the good resilience work that's done. And this is one of the things that we call it kind of the gross risk at a given position and then the net risk once you take into consideration protection, resilience measures, recoverability, et cetera. So it's very much a team effort at this point um, with Flood Re driving it and Catherine providing great background and knowledge because you may not know, but she's been working on these kind of disasters stateside and then here in the UK for many years, but very much linked into the heartbeat of what's happening, yes, within businesses, but as Flood Re also with um, homeowners. And then for me at Marsh, I deal with lots of social housing as part of that role. And so the people that you can see here are the ones that we have in mind as being the people who have to say, this scoring mechanism works for us. It fits in with our workflows. It fits in with our processes. And this is how we currently assess risk. Now, this are the three things we change to be how we now currently assess resilience. And of course, all of this underpins what we're then doing with the flood performance certificates. So I wanted to put this in here to make it really clear that as we build this out, all ideas are being fed in, all viewpoints we're trying to consider, and we're not just jumping um, to a conclusion of how this is gonna work. 
There is precedent with things like energy performance certificates, but whether we go in that direction or not, that needs proper evaluation. There is precedent elsewhere in other countries around the world who are beginning to look at this. Similarly, we need to see whether those are good models and we need to put proper thought into how we embed this within those business processes. If you could jump onto the next slide, I'm gonna do one more minute on some of the key things that in this early stage, we're already considering. Um, and my colleague, Dr. David Kelly will be speaking tomorrow about some of these aspects. And similarly tomorrow, I'll also give you some real live case studies of how we see all of this happening. So obviously residential and commercial, we've already said that. It's gotta be able to deal with all of the different types of properties. It's got to be simple and understandable because frankly, it needs to be covered in seconds when a mortgage underwriting decision is being made and a lookup is being done. It's got to be acceptable for underwriters. We're not going to provide something and then hope and trust that people will follow and they'll adopt it. That's not the right way to approach this. And that's where all of those initial discussions really fed in. We need to be clear that it's gonna reflect the theory of the code, but also the practice of all of you. So similarly, when you're out and you're doing something like a resilience score, it's got to make sense it's got to make sense for the building you're looking at, but it's also got to make sense in how you're doing your assessment. Um, and then we want to make sure that as part of that, it's linked into other good tools that are coming through, like resilience, surveying um, environments, tools, etc. And most importantly, it's got to be applicable across the whole of the UK. One thing we've really strived for as part of the roundtable is to ensure that we have representation from England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And that fits wonderfully with my world because I serve all of those geographies and wider with the work that we do um, with businesses um, and, and homes as well. Um, so that's, I think, all from us. If you just want to finish off with another view of the methodology slide, you'll be hearing more on all of this, the key pieces of the jigsaw puzzle over the coming months and years as we build out all of this. But let me hand you back to Anya now. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Catherine and Bev. Uh, and yes, moving swiftly on, I'll hand over now to, to Ian. So thanks again. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, lovely. It's nice to follow up from my colleagues who've set a really great picture of the code um, and you know how you can get information on it, but also you know how this fits into a bigger picture of needing to value flood resilience. So the question I'm really trying to cover with you now is how we get the skills out there in order to deliver on what we're talking about. So, you know, what is the current understanding of best practice? Well, for the people that have been involved in the code, obviously very high and the people that we interact with regularly. So there's, there's people out there becoming more aware of it, um, but it's very much focused around the flooding industries. So the people who, who would be doing this work anyway. And, and we feel still there's um, a lack of awareness in the general public and businesses of the code of practice largely because when we brought it out, it's just before the pandemic, and clearly the whole world has been worrying about other things. So there's work on the round table being done now to, 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 um, to sort of put, get that message out there again, when, when perhaps um, there's a better chance for people to be able to hear. So can you find the right skills if you, if you want to do um, flood resilience? Well, the, the skills are definitely out there, but it's not easy for a consumer to find those skills because there isn't a register, um, there isn't an organisation or anything like that you go to to say, oh, these people are qualified and, and they, they'll be able to help me be that contractor or a con uh, that's doing the works or a professional that's providing a survey. Um, so currently the best way to find the skills is probably to recommendation. So to go um, to people that are involved in the industry and ask them. Um, but as I said, there is no, no, no register. So without that, um, we, you know, we really have a problem for your average person or business trying to, trying to undertake these works. So the reason I say we need to do something now is that as a, uh, the government, as I mentioned earlier, are, are, are changing their, their focus into not just building defences, but helping people to understand and live with water, and live with the risk that we all face. Um, equally, the other issue is, insurers are toughening their stance because they're being hit by repeated flood instances and it's really not economic for them to insure a lot of these properties. Um, so you add that to increase risks of flooding and climate change 
um, there's a real uh, reason why something needs to happen um, in terms of training. The other thing that um, the great work Catherine and the team are doing at Flood Re about Build Back Better, which is um, the opportunity to um, build back more resilience when you have a claim and your, your, um, your property is being insured um, ultimately by Flood Re uh, for the flood aspect. So that's another reason why we need to train people up to be able to deliver this. Um, on the next slide, um, I'm talking a bit about um, how you build that awareness and engagement. Um, we, we obviously have said people know about it, they're involved in this, but having a wider um, understanding and knowledge. We've been doing a lot of work. Um, people might have heard of the, um, the different three projects around the UK that we've been doing in the Southwest um, and York and in Oxcams, the Pathfinder projects they're called. And those are about communicating with the public and industry and businesses, communities. You know, this is what flood resilience is all about. So that's one way that's, you know, practical implementation of getting the message out there. Um, other work's being done on communication strategies and social media, how we can get the message out there about flood risk and the opportunity to do something about it. But obviously we need clients to be able to say, well, I, I'm aware of the code of practice. I'm aware there's a need to get it done right. So start asking those questions. Um, become aware just of the existence of the code. All you need to do is ask do, to the person that you might be working with, do you know about it? Tell me about it. Explain you, you know, you've, you're skilled in this area. Insurers, the area that I work predominantly in, but, but also in the non-insurance world, they need to build awareness both within their organizations, with their supply chain and with their customers. Um, and we need to see that this is really a, an opportunity for businesses to develop their offerings and, and produce products which and deliver products with the flood resilience. So how are you going to build that engagement ultimately? Well, there's, there's for me in the insurance side of things, we need to normalize the process. So it needs to be part of what we do. And we go to a claim, we say hello to the customer, we explain where we're from. And part of the next stage of the discussions during that first visit should be flood resilience um, when they've had a flood. Surveyors um, and contractors, as they see the market growing, obviously they want to build their skills because they'll see an opportunity for them to deliver for their clients. Um, and also the, from the other side, you're looking at flood groups, educating people in the flood risk areas to ask the right questions. So suppliers that are trained um, uh, you know, will, be, will, be, uh, will be employed and not the ones that aren't. Um, and finally, my final slide, I was just, uh, just showing you about building the skills. So this training, I've been working with a number of colleagues in different organisations to write the training. So the Environment Agency has sponsored this training that's been um, created by SiteWEM. Um, and what we've done is we've tried to create a set of training which obviously delivers for the Environment Agency in terms of being able to um, you know, upskill their people so they are, can, can understand what, what's possible from PFR, but also um, that the, the flood authorities and the, the flood forums or flood groups, they need that knowledge too. And finally, we need the skills in the surveyors, the um, flood risk specialists, the contractors, uh, everybody involved in this process needs to understand how the code of practice works, what their part is in that code and how they deliver it together. So it's a trusted product that Catherine and Bev can, can, can value. With their project. So the, the stage we're at now is um, available from the end of the year, the training, we're just doing the final parts of it. Um, we want to just raise this competency, um, make sure that we people can consistently get the, the knowledge um, to deliver on resilience from their professionals or from their contractors um, to build that trust. So I think on that note, just so we've got time for some questions, I'll end there. Great, thanks very much, Ian. Uh, okay, yes, yeah, so I can see that's uh, been quite active, the Q&A there. So um, I'll be passing over to Alistair. And at this point, I'll stop showing my screen so that as we uh, hear from, get questions directed and hear from people, we can see your faces on the screen. Um, so Alistair, is that okay if I, uh, I pass over to you now? Yeah, that's great, Anya, thanks very much. Okay. Um, Alistair, Catherine, 
Bev, Ian, thanks uh, ever so much for your um, presentations. I think that teased the, the discussion up um, really well. I'm going to take kind of uh, Chair's prerogative here and, and chuck a couple out there uh, to start off. Um, and I think probably on the first one, you've maybe answered uh, the question to, to a degree. Um, but really just picking up the overall theme of, of this, this webinar series in terms of, um, you know, what the key enablers are for moving PFR forward. Alistair, when, um, when you set the scene, you know, you referred to uh, the Bonfield report and, and um, things having been really being driven forward by the round table and, and DEFRA for at least five years now. Um, and I think in terms of the, the short term enablers, to, to really see PFR being um, mainstreamed and delivered to really high quality ex, uh, extensively in terms of the short term enablers and also the longer term enablers. What do you think are really the things that can, can crack this and, and um, really drive that uptake up? Well, the, the short term enablers for me were, were initially for people to actually understand what property flood resilience actually meant, because uh, as I, I think I implied in the, I had to cram an awful lot into a short space of time there. It isn't just about sticking a gate across the door to stop the water getting in, which is quite common. I mean, you've saw that, seen that for years, people having their plastic gates across, but the water can find its way into all sorts of other places and then do terrible devastation. So the code of practice has really helped that. It's really helped to make clear what are the main components of a property that might um, allow the water to get in that you can stop it and also understanding what your flood risk actually is because uh, you may well be sitting behind some flood defences and think everything's fine you know there's not a problem but then when the one in 300 year storm comes along and they, they get beaten you're at risk and um, property flood resilient measures could easily be a, a, last, a measure of last resort if you like just to keep that flow out and I think in the longer term it has to be the skills so um, the, the work that Sarwin's been doing has been fantastic with the training programme with the Environment Agency. Um, the construction industry is a, is a very strange place to, to work because uh, there are, you, it's not like being a surgeon. You don't have to have a particular qualification to go and do something. You can show your qualifications by having done your city and guilds or your degrees, but anybody can be a builder. And I'm, and I'm afraid that's a sad fact of life that we are left at risk a lot of the time. So what, all we can do as an industry is set down standards that people adhere to. And, um, and then people will ask the question, have you, have you, are you skilled in doing this? And they can show a certificate. So I think those are the two measures, making it clear what it is, what materials are available to use, and then also training people to actually know how to apply them properly and to, and to guarantee that flood resilience in the future. I also want to even take a step back and and actually talk about the householder because in the best instance the PFR is done pre-flood so it's not done with an ad loss adjuster or, or after a claim it's done in a proactive sort of sunny day and that kind of outreach needs to happen in a moment where a homeowner is already kind of thinking about maybe a kitchen upgrade or a retrofit of you know a new paint job or new flooring or something like that and they need to sort of passively walk through sourcing or conversations with contractors where somebody says by the way you know we are living in a changing climate environment risk is going up you have opportunities to choose product A or product B and product B might one day leave you in a better position than product A and why not? And that's a journey that has to, you know, often these are sort of long-term, let me think about what I wanna do next year. Well, next year comes uh, the kids of different ages, we need different things. It's, it's a long-term engagement. And I think as people are, often um, treating their home not as I wake up on Saturday and think, let me make my home more resilient tomorrow. That's not how people interact with their homes. And I think we have to meet people where they are. And so if this is a grant program that's being done by the EA, I've heard of best practices where, you know, it's a handwritten letter that says we're coming on 
Tuesday and there's a picture of the person who's going to show up and then you knock on the door and it's a familiar face in essence and they say here are the strategies that are and with the code of practice and other things that are kite marked and so there's just a level of confidence and personalization in the actual execution that brings people along because it's ultimately a human decision and people are not known to be rational and don't face risks head on. So the essence of taking control and getting your home in a climate ready way, I think is a more appealing than my home's at risk of flooding and I need to plug the gap is sort of a spin that I would um, move us away from. Sure, sure. So a bit of a narrative flip, really, to, to focus on um, confidence and trust and being prepared. Bev and, and Ian, do you have anything to add to that? I certainly do, because and Ian, you're probably going to say the same thing, because there are key moments in the life cycle of businesses, let's just say, when PFR need to needs to happen. And the obvious one is after a flood loss. And it's one of those ironies where we all know about it. Therefore, why would you ever put together a, a scope of work for reinstatement that, that didn't consider it? And yet, ugh, having been for certain sites where they're now on their third flood and the first two they recovered not resiliently, it's a worry. Um, and so there's moments like that. The other thing that I see is that at renewal for insurance, Businesses that have flood risk are really having a problem. They're being denied cover and they're being denied cover. It's not like they're being offered terms sometimes or they'll be given huge deductibles. And that can really cause a massive problem for the, for the business to know how they're going to keep working. And so that's another key moment where your insurance broker sh should be offering you counsel that it isn't all doom and gloom. But with resilience to counterbalance that risk, actually you can take action and you can solve the situation and still get cover. Of course, it's our job also to advise on other kinds of insurances like parametric, you know, but that's not the focus of today. Then, and this is what I'll talk about tomorrow, there are other kind of key moments when that's why we use the term design resilient. So I've got an example I'll talk about tomorrow, which is a leisure center where the structure was built to a one in 100 year return period. And yet the insurers then come back and said, no, 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 we need a one in 200 return period confidence in, in the flood mitigation that's in place. Well, frankly, that would have been nice to know before the designs were all put in place. And so you imagine we lay out each of these different steps along the way when PFR has to be factored in and it becomes actually quite a clear roadmap. And that's what we're trying to, instill within people with this idea of design resilient, refit resilient. Uh, if you're refitting your store, why not do it in a manner that's resilient? And that's where those kind of like that language came from. Um, and if anyone's interested in kind of knowing what those key moments are, I think maybe actually, Ian, we should write a bit of a paper on that, a bit of a refresh for people. Yeah, I agree. I only had a, only had a couple of points there. Great stuff from everyone that's spoken, exactly right. If you make it really simple, you'd say domestic is going to be driven by build back better from flood re. And commercial is going to be driven by exactly what Bev says, an imperative to do something uh, before we educate people more about when there's opportunities, which we're talking about there, Bev. Um, and, and thirdly, in a round table, we've got like a, a route map for the uptake of property flood resilience. And that's looking at all the different sectors that could influence and drive it from government to finance to surveyors so we realize there's a longer term strategy to look at how all those different routes might bring flood resilience but really that's a the longer term strategy it's domestic commercial as a sort of those two approaches i think you know to, to summarize yeah i think someone's just popped in the chat that knowing those key moments would be really helpful i think maybe we'll take it as a to do that we need to lay that out alistair i, I think that would be super helpful for people. i think it would yeah um yeah yeah, yeah. And you imagine a future, you imagine a future world where there is a flood performance certificate, then people will have to do it. And it's just, I guess, linking back where we are today ahead of that so that we can start people early. Well, it's not really early, is it? It's late, but we can start people doing it with those key moments in mind. So I think that's a really useful takeaway from today for me, actually. And Alistair, I think we should probably 
figure out how we could do that as the round table. Definitely, definitely. Um, I think it sort of points, there's, there's some issues around awareness and confidence and, and that kind of thing in PFR and how it can be delivered and, and the kind of questions that people need to ask and, and all of that kind of thing. But there's, there's clearly some concerns out there as well. And, and I can see, Bev, that um, one of the questions in, in the Q&A, you, you'd um, started to, to put an answer down, but um, it's around some com communities having a fear that if they have PFR, then it might um, reduce the, the ability of them getting bigger schemes because of it, it impacts on the um, cost benefit analysis when, when the business case for those larger schemes is, is delivered. How can we um, optimize delivery of, of PFR and uptake of PFR without there being unintended consequences? Or if that's a misunderstanding, how can we dispel those kind of misunderstandings around um, the relative value and performance of more conventional flood defences alongside PFR, do you think? Um, maybe just a quick word on that. Um, I think it's so complex what would drive decisions about investment in the scheme. And there's many risks that you have apart from most, obviously river risk is what, or coastal risk is what the environment agent can protect against. If you've got surface water flood risk, which is more prevalent than the other two risks, then it's not going to fix you anyway. So I think yeah. it's I think it's probably a lack of understanding of what the real challenges that particular area faces. And when that's understood, then you'll understand practically where there's any chance of getting a defense scheme anyway. And secondly, if that scheme is really going to cover more than half your, your risk. So I think it's probably a question born from um, a lack of detailed knowledge of that particular area's risk. Once you know the risk, you can start to assess the approaches. And anyway, you know, I've been to Carlisle three times and there have been defences in Carlisle all the time and we've still gone back. So the question isn't necessarily that you, you do this because I'm going to get a defence and the world's going to be happy then. The world will be OK when you have layers of defence and preparation. Yeah, absolutely. Has anybody else got any yeah. observations on that? I was going to comment on that. As, um... I've always seen this property flood resilience as being a part of a package of measures. This isn't just a one fix on its own, which is why you do need the overview of a good flood risk authority. So the LFA, LLFAs have a big part to play in this in their areas. And of course the Environment Agency does, which is why the Environment Agency has put so much effort into the training and is also um, on the pathway to create some new um, uh, contract, contracts for, for delivering it, which the LL, LLFAs will also be able to take part in. So it's a, it's part of a package of measures. It goes with upland catchment management, it goes with flood defences. And as I, as I mentioned, you know, you may need is even behind a flood defence if, if, you know, if, if it couldn't be afforded to put in the, the complete package that we might like, um, you could then use PFR on the periphery. So it's, it's there to be seen by the flood, flood professionals and used I mean, I realise this is talking from the institutional point of view, not the actual homeowner, because the homeowner's challenge is very, very different. But I'm taking, in terms of a society and looking at our infrastructure, it's got a part to play, I think, in our, in our overall flood risk management strategy. Sure, agreed. Um, and I think in terms of people getting that, um, you know, the, the right picture, the right advice, um, someone else has asked a question about really where they go to to get that um find the list of of um who's working against the code now where the uh kind of approved contractors are or or um the most uh forward forward thinking and and um up to speed contractors are and i think there's possibly some things going on through the eas pathfinder program to that effect but um where do we feel that uh that direction, that that source of advice should should come from in terms of um, where people can go to to get flood risk assessments done, get PFR installed, get um, properly balanced advice on on which PFR uh, is most appropriate for them. Um, probably me that one. Um, I would say at the moment there is nowhere obvious. There's no one place to go. That's the problem. Um, I would say looking at your um, Local flood groups is always a good place to go if you're just talking about a local advice because they will have engaged with, they'll have better engagement in the industry and know who's recognised as experienced. Um, 
the Environment Agency have a list of, obviously work with lists of contractors and with professionals doing surveys. Um, so unfortunately, the way to do it, I think, is to immerse yourself a bit more in understanding the industry by speaking to people that know about it to get some good recommendations. Because um, you know, if you're suffering, if you have an insurance claim, it's fine because you could go to your insurance company and they'll put you through to someone probably, you know, probably the easy way to do it. But we want PFRs to be on the outside of that, as Bev said. What about you know when you're refurbing? What about if you're doing extension? And that's 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 trickier because you're not engaged with anybody in flooding. Then you just want an extension bill. So, um, but we will be be training on starting at the end of this year. So next year you'll be able to ask the question: Has the person go to go to Cywen as we start to look for a register and create that sort of um, that that and be able to say to the person: Have you that you ask even if you're not sure? You say: Well, have you done the Cywen training? So I think, you know, but you have to meet someone first, right? So it's a bit matchmaking, isn't it? It's a challenge at the moment. But that we, we don't think it'll be too long until we start to overcome that, that challenge. Yeah, and I guess it, it comes back to those um, key life cycle moments that Catherine mentioned. Really, when people are going through those um, points that they know where to look to get that advice at that point in time. Um, and, and sometimes it's... Is kind of maybe fed to them post flood, for example, through the insurers. Then that that's maybe a route. But other times it it might not be obvious. So, um, yeah, great. Uh, so there's a question around um, insurance, and this is probably the last one we're going to be able to take. But um, whether or not insurance companies at the moment are discouraged from building back better. Um, as property owners might change their policy after a year. So that how long do insurers need to be engaged with that customer to make it worth their while, I guess, to, to um, push build back better? I can take that one. In an ideal scenario, there would be multi-year um, contracts for home insurance or commercial insurance, but in the absence of those, um, it is a it is a slight deterrent. However, um, with recent uh, consumer protection and um, I think it's CFA uh, intervention, there you can't undercut pricing um, if you switch providers. So that those discounts that were previously available for switching your insurance are going away. So therefore the stickiness is likely to increase. And we already know that a number of insurers, including NFU and Lloyd's Banking Group are doing cost neutral build back better schemes already. So this is a way to differentiate yourself actually as an insurer and by doing the right thing. And I'll add one more point on this is that as ESG reporting, um, for insurers gets more granular, a element of the social piece of that, if you have environment, social, and governance as the key pillars, focuses down on things like this. And if you're doing the right thing vis-a-vis -vis building back better, um, you'll get sort of higher points um, on your ESG grading, which is becoming a bigger and bigger focus of strategic boards, um, whether they're regulated here or in the US or on other European um, regulatory environments. Right, thanks, Catherine. Now, I think that's, um, that's a really nice optimistic note to end on um, for our Q&A. So um, we're almost out of time and I really need to hand back to Anya. Um, so thanks ever so much for uh, your presentations again and, and that really interesting discussion, thanks. Great. Thanks, Alistair, and uh, and thanks all. Um, yes, yeah, so positive note, we've had lots of uh, points raised, and, and sadly, yeah, we haven't had time to get through them all. Um, so I'd encourage people to, to attend tomorrow's session and Thursday as well. Um, so tomorrow's uh, tomorrow's session is uh, Customer Perspectives on, on PFR, um, and that one's going to be hosted by Mary Donau, who's, uh, I believe, is attending today and has lots of experience uh, helping you know, real examples helping people out. So um, that should be interesting um, as well. Uh, and I'm just going to use this opportunity as well for to highlight the Urban Drainage Group um, 
have their virtual annual conference coming up uh, between the 9th and 11th of November, um, which is which is virtual as well, um, but kind of li linked to surface water flooding and all that and all that stuff. So uh, do do check that out. Um, I'm assuming Barbara will put the link to that in the chat. Um, but yeah, just wanted to say thank you all for attending. Uh, we had a high amount of attendance today, and thank you very much to everyone for taking the time to to speak um, and and ask questions. And yeah, let's uh, let's keep the discussion going, and hopefully use this series as a as a way of keeping that conversation conversation going. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you all.